station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station where we are ready. Space.com, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Space.com. How do you hear me? Hello, Denise. Mike Fossum with you, loud and clear. Hi, Commander. It's so nice to speak to you this morning. Um, I've got a fun one to start us off. Uh, is there anything special planned for Halloween on the space station? You know, we haven't looked forward to Halloween. We have a, a there is a bag of some of the personal items up here that uh, the crews have brought up in the past. Uh, right on the top are the Christmas kind of items. I'm going to look underneath that and see if we have some masks or something we can have a little fun with that day. Um, Commander, you've been living in space for a couple months now. Um, with the population of Earth set to surpass 7 billion people, um, I'm curious as to how evident humans are from space. Um, is it at all evident how much the population has grown, either in how many lights you see? I'm not sure, you know, quite how to measure that. There's places on the Earth where it's very evident. There are not many people uh, going across parts of the rainforest in Africa and South America. You could see the unbroken, dark green forest canopy uh, that goes on seemingly without end. And then, of course, you do reach the end, and you see that, that where uh, where people are moving in and uh, and uh, you know and changing the earth, changing the face of it. It's really the most evident, though, at night when the lights come up. Uh, and you can see where the industrialized world lives. It's quite stunning to, uh, to spend time let, to light adjust in the cupola or one of the other windows in the space station and go across uh, parts of the world that are uh, heavily populated. And you see the cities. You can see the highways across uh, remote areas in certain countries and then the, the small bits of uh, communities that sprout up off of those highways or rail railways, perhaps. So it's, it's really fascinating, I think, to look at this, the Earth at night because it gives you uh, that idea of the footprint of the presence a little more clearly. That's fascinating. Um, we also asked our, our readers what they were most curious about living and working from space, so I'm going to ask a few of their questions now. Um, one of our readers, Vicki Barker, would like to know, uh, what's the one thing besides friends and family that you miss most about home? A good question from Vicki Barker. I think for me, it's fresh fruit and vegetables would be near the top of my list because if eventually you get a little tired of eating food out of a pouch, rehydrated or or stabilized. Uh, I, I think a really good pizza is high on my list of things too. So it's it's creature comforts, things that uh, uh, that I, I want to eat. Another thing that I miss are just the sounds and smells of nature, of of growing things. Of, of the damp, moist earth that, uh, from, from which springs forth life. I really miss that. Great. And Rob would like to know, um, would you command a mission to Mars right now if it were possible and if you were given the choice? And if so, what top three personal items would you bring to leave there? Wow. Uh, the first one I can answer hands down, absolutely. Uh, when I was a child dreaming about going into space, I started a notebook on Mars because I was pretty sure I was going to see human footprints on Mars uh, and I, that I might have the chance to put those footprints on there myself or, or add mine to others. Uh, I don't think it's likely I'm going to be going to Mars now, but I, I do still think that I will see that uh, in my lifetime, in our lifetimes, and look forward to it a lot. Uh, I, I'd have to not sure what I would leave, what I would take to leave on Mars uh, as just part of representing humankind. Um, I'll have to pass on that one. <laughs> uh, Tim Green asks, um, despite having gone through countless hours of training, what has surprised you the most on the International Space Station that your training did not cover? You know, that's a really interesting uh, interesting question. Not very much, because our training is extensive, but a as with all training for this kind of business, most of your training focuses on the emergency scenarios and, and when you really have to get into the details of knowing the systems, knowing how to, how to respond. And, and, and it's critical that you know all of those things for an emergency situation. But thankfully, we have very little opportunity to exercise those up here. And so there's more 
on the job training for a lot of the payloads work we do, and the simple things like going through and cleaning all of the filters, uh, you know, and things like that. And so for me, that was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, I found a filter just last week that uh, I, I had not cleaned in a while. I didn't know it was there. And they, we were measuring airflow, doing some airflow measurements, and it was a little low, and uh, mission control asked me to check this filter. I said, ooh, that's going to be a problem. Opened up the panel, and there was a you know, big fur ball back there. And so that's just some of the realities of living and working in space and, and taking over a complex that's this big, longer and wider than a football field, and a lot of, uh, a lot of details uh, hidden behind little panels that you didn't even know were there. Um, Vince asks, uh, what do you feel is needed to recapture the imagination and passion of people to explore the stars? Um, with budget cuts and a weak economy, what can we do to inspire and drive our young people and our governments to make exploration an important priority? Hey, Vince, continue to tell the story, and that's what I'm trying to do up here along with the other work that we're doing, is just to share the story of what we're doing, the successes, uh, the failures, the things that are, that are hard, the things that are fun because it's an amazing adventure, it really is, and I think it's worth doing. I think it really speaks to the pioneering spirit that's part of being an American and that, that wants to explore, wants to find ways to, to reach out to new places and figure out how not just to visit them, but how to tame them and how to make them ours uh, and, and to, to, to live there, not just visit, which has been a, a great part of my experience, having visited space twice on short missions and now living here for months. It's a very, very different experience. Uh, and I think we just need to continue to tell that story and to capture the imagination because as you capture the public's imagination and the imagination of, 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 of not just young kids, but even the college-age kids and, and other people early in their working careers that want to make a difference in some way, they're not all going to fly in space. Uh, they're not all going to get involved in the space program. But through technology, we can influence our world. And, and a lot of the problems of our world have come about because of advances in technology. We like the lights on, so we build power plants. And there's a downside to that. But technology is going to be our solution for the future, too, to help clean those up and find ways to use our resources more responsibly, leave a smaller human footprint. Um, Tim Nunez asks, well, I'm sure that NASA thoroughly screens for claustrophobia. Do you ever feel strained or otherwise impacted after months of confined living? And if so, how do you alleviate this? Uh, yes, we are. It, we, part of the screening is for claustrophobia, and for good reason, because you would not be a happy camper uh, shoved into the, particularly into the spacecraft for getting up here. Once you get to the space station, uh, it, there's there's room up here, and it's big enough that we have some room to work alone sometimes. And you, it's, and, and we're all working actually in different corners of the space station, frequently. Uh, daily, we're working separate from each other. Uh, and so there's 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 room to get away, and if you really have to, you know, want to just get away and think about home, uh, you can go to the cupola and watch home go by underneath you, or uh, make a phone call literally uh, to home to talk to our families. And so I, I am surprised really at at how I don't think about being cooped up here at all. It, it's hard for me to comprehend having been here already for four and a half months. And it, we just, it just doesn't seem like it at all. It's, it's, uh, it's a great place, and it doesn't feel small to me. I, we get along fine, and that's a really good thing. Uh, Milton Rivera asks, when I see pictures of Earth from space, I see a miracle. What do you as scientists see, and are you still in awe of the view out of the windows? Well, that's a, a really good question, and I, I have to say that on my first shuttle flight, one of my jobs, as soon as the engines cut off, was to unstrap and grab cameras and jump up to the window to look out and, and get pictures of the external fuel tank as it fell away. And for me, after dreaming from childhood and working through my you know, education and professional career for this opportunity, finally be it struck me looking out the window that I'm not looking at a video, I'm not looking at a picture, I'm looking through a lot of layers of glass with my own eyes out the window at the North Atlantic with a, a, a dappling of white clouds over the top and this curved horizon with this impossibly thin layer of atmosphere and then a black sky up above. And what struck me immediately was I'm looking at the Earth from God's point of view, looking down at the Earth like this. And uh, that does strike me the same way. You know, as, as a technical person, 
I couldn't claim to be a scientist, but as a technical person, I do also appreciate the, the processes of, of nature, the, the geology. I love going across the parts of the planet where the rocks really stand out, to see the geology, to see the fault lines, the mountains, the oceans. It's a, it's a fascinating thing to watch. Well, I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, Commander Fossum, thank you so much. Good luck with the remainder of your mission, and have a safe trip home. Thanks, Denise. I really enjoyed talking to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Space.com portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from ABC Radio. Station, this is ABC. Can you hear me? Good morning. Hey, can you hear me? Good morning. Hey, Vic. Mike Foss, I'm on the space station, loud and clear. Good morning, Mike. Good to see you. Tell me a little bit about it's good what to be life here. Is, good to talk to you. How life is different now that the space shuttle is no longer bringing you goodies every couple of months. Well, it, it is different. The pace of things changed. When I arrived, of course, I've been here twice as part of that whirlwind shuttle crew experience. Uh, and when I arrived, we were a few weeks away from the arrival of Atlantis for the final shuttle mission, and so we jumped immediately into preparations for that. And it's a different ball game when there, there's a, an absolute uh, date that you're working toward and you have a lot of work to do. And it was pretty frantic. I, frantic maybe not the right word, but it was really busy working up to that. Uh, you know, and since that, that part of that, you know, and going through the mission, and it was a, just a wonderful experience. It was a very emotional experience, too. But now we're in a different phase of operations, and this is why we built the space station, so we could continue and really concentrate not on preparations for a shuttle docking and, and more assembly, but concentrate on the science objectives. And we've had a lot of uh, uh, I mean, really good experiences and even fun activating the new facilities and changing out the, the different samples and, and getting a lot of different uh, science projects up and running, and it's been great. And so the focus has changed. Instead of that frantic assembly operations, uh, shuttle docked ops, it's, it's more to the utilization. It's a great thing. Have you already got a long list of things that you would like the shuttle to bring up to you, except the shuttle's not there anymore? Surprisingly not. Uh, the it, it, They brought so much this time. We have you know, food and supplies to last for many months, uh, some things up to a year. So we're in, in really good shape there. There's a, a, you know, a small list of things. It's like, okay, next time we get a chance. In fact, the progress flight, or the prog we have a, a progress flight in a few weeks, the end of the month, and, you know, they're bringing stuff up, and there was a, there was move in Houston. It's like, okay, what are our top priority items to get up there? And, uh, you know, there's a few things coming up with it. There's a few things coming up uh, with the uh, next crew on the Soyuz. So we have cargo capability, you know, in place. Uh, you know, we've had a, a little, I mean, we've had, of course, with the Progress accident, uh, then that cargo shipped down. We've lost some things there, but there was nothing uh, particularly critical in that, and we're, supply, we're well supplied. At this point in your flight, Mike, uh, what do you miss most? Is it, uh, it's fall. How about apples and leaves on the ground? Do uh, you have a grandchild? That kind of thing. You bet. Well, I yeah, you, I, I miss my granddaughter, that's for sure. She was very young when I left, and she's changed so much while I've been up here. I'm fortunate to have seen uh, some little video clips of her and, uh, and get the chance to uh, talk mostly at her, but uh, hear her on the phone. Uh, and it's, uh, that's, uh, you know, probably the single person that I, I, you know, just I can't communicate with her yet. And so all I can do is look at pictures and, and I can't talk to her on the phone. So I, I miss her. And I definitely miss apples. Uh, the fall is the time for those fresh, crisp apples. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to some of those coming up on the progress. Oh, that's the first I've heard about a progress bringing up that kind of thing. A pizza, maybe? No, I don't think pizza will make the trip, but uh, you bet the, every, uh, the Russian vehicles come up with an assortment of uh, fruit and vegetables. So we'll have apples, oranges. Um, there'll be actually, uh, uh, there's always onions and uh, perhaps even garlic. And so those are, it's, it, it's great to, to taste the earth. And I, I, another thing that I miss really is just the, the sights, the smells and sounds of nature. 
it's a, it's a little sterile inside a laboratory living environment like this, and I miss the sound of the birds in the backyard and uh, the smells of just things that are growing. What's your granddaughter being told that you're doing up there? Uh, she's she's too young to understand uh, what she's being told, but uh, on the uh, at the top of my short list of things to do before I leave is to make a tour, a uh, video of a tour for my granddaughter. And so in a couple of years, when she's old enough to start to understand these things, she's going to have to endure another one of those talks with Grandpa Mike as we sit down to watch my movie. Serious subject. There's a scientific report that says... Almost half of the people who have been on the ISS have had eye problems when they return. Serious eye problems. How worried are you about that? That is, of course, something that gets everybody's attention when you, when you hear about this and, and learn about it. Uh, we're screened a lot to, to try to uh, keep, uh, you know, in a number of different ways, looking at our interocular pressures, the same kind of exams that are done in a doctor's office at home, and we measure those up here. We take uh, actually ultrasounds of our eyes, our optic nerves, uh, as well as uh, scans of the retina. Uh, these, are, these are just diagnostic tools that are used uh, at the doctor's office back home, and we're using them rem with remote guidance up here to help track these kind of things. There's something going on there with the eyes that we don't understand, uh, and that's a potentially significant thing. Uh, we're fortunate uh, that we're not experiencing anything that, uh, that appears to be you know, of that nature, which just adds a little more confusion to it. Don't know why some people are affected uh, and some are uh, you know, less affected. But it's something we need to understand and kind of get, get to the bottom of. If we uh, you know, want to continue, and one of the things we're trying to do is learn how to live and work in space for long periods of time. When we go to Mars, it's going to be a long trip. We're going to be you know, off of the Earth for a couple of years probably, going there, getting some work done, coming back. And we need to understand things like this. And this came as a kind of a surprise, but it's part of why we do this uh, long duration research with us human guinea pigs. Do you have a kind of hunch about that? Do you think it's radiation? I, I do not. The, the kind of hunches that I, that I had don't seem to have played out. Uh, and I, I couldn't explain why there's, you know, again, why it affects some people and does not affect, uh, does not appear to affect others the same way. Uh, no idea. Okay, last question. Time's running out. What are you going to be dressed as for Halloween? I don't know. I might do something outrageous and dress like an astronaut. I always wanted to be one. <laughs> there must be a mask up there. There is, there is, there's a bag of things like that, and I, I know where the bag is located, but I have not had a chance to dig into it and uh, pick mine out, so I, I'll, I'm sorry about that. We'll have to do an interview again next week, and I'll, I'll pull it out. Okay, safe journey, safe trip back home. Thanks a lot. Thanks a bunch. I really appreciate uh, the interview, the time to uh, talk to you, and this is Mike Fossum on the International Space Station. Signing out. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, Space.com and ABC Radio. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.